Okay, so there we go. We want to find all the sides and all the angles for that triangle. Now, we did this yesterday. We did this yesterday, but um, this one's a little different. Number three is a little different than number one and number two because they're not giving me any angles. Do you see the difference? There is one angle. Well, yeah, the 90-degree angle. But uh, other than the 90, they're not telling me the other two. So anyway, let's, let's start with, see, I've already got all the answers right there for you. Let's see how we got it. So first off, how do we go about finding, C? remember, remember the, the capital letters are the angles, A, B, and C, and the little letters, little a, little b, little c, those are the sides. That's the way they're always going to do it. Little letters for the sides, big letters for the angles, and notice they put A across from A, B across from B, C across from C, because they're wanting to put in your mind the idea that an angle as it opens up affects the side across from it, huh? The bigger an angle opens, the bigger the side across from it gets. So, what do we do? We want to find C. So they're telling me, what are they giving me? Little a is 13.6, and little b is 22.8. So how do we use those two to find the little c? Use what's that? Cosine of C? No, not cosine of C. That won't work. Pythagorean? Yeah, we we'll use Pythag. Oh. Pythag, right? So, yeah, go ahead and do the Pythag. So, A squared plus B squared is C squared. The A is 13.6. 13.6 squared plus 22.8 squared is C squared. So, whip that out in your calculator. I'm getting 184.96 plus 22.8 squared, 519.84. Add those together. Oh, wait. 519 plus. I'm getting 704.8. Is C squared. And last step, square rooted, huh? Yeah, and that's, yeah, and they want you to round it two places. So 26.55, right? Did you get that rounded? 26.55? Like that. So that's side C, 26.55. 26.55. So now, we, so we got all the sides now. Good. Just using the Pythagorean theorem. We got all three sides. How do we get the um, angles? Other, I mean, we have the 90. But how did I come up with those other two angles? Any ideas on, because this is, this is what's new. The way we got the angles yesterday, when we did problems one and two in this section, is they gave us the 90 and one other angle, so I just subtracted from 90, huh? But now I don't have either one of those. I don't have A or B. Can we use a trig function using the 90 degree angle? No, not using the 90. Um, yeah, yeah, since that's been mentioned twice, let's go ahead and talk about why that would be a problem. If I tried to use a trig function using this angle, 90 degree, this is the hypotenuse, right? This is, well, what would be oh, the adjacent and what would be the opposite? Okay. The hypotenuse is the opposite. Uh, that's almost the formula, but it's sine in front of one of those. Yeah. It's sine A over A, it's sine B over B, law of sines. You could, if you know that, you can do it. We, the rest of us will wait till next week when we learn the law of sines. What about inverse? But that would work. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. So, um, so let's just, let's do this. Let's just put, um, let's just call this, well, I mean, this is angle A. So here's angle A. Let's just start with angle A. Um, and how about we, now, what, remember, we're, we don't want to use a rounded number. Right? We don't want to use a rounded number. So we don't want to use that 26.55, huh? Right. Right? So we're going to use the 13.6 and the 22.8. So what trig relationship will involve angle A? This is the opposite from A, the adjacent, the hypotenuse. So what trig relationship will involve the 13.6 and the 22.8? Remember, so Katoa, your favorite... 
Little acronym. The inverse of tangent. Tangent. Right? So at first I'm just going to write tangent. Tangent of angle A equals, get this out of the way here. Tangent of angle A is opposite over adjacent, right? TOA, opposite over adjacent. 13.6 over 22.8. Good so far? Tangent, right? Tangent of angle A is opposite over adjacent. Now, I'm trying to find the A, the angle A. How am I going to do that? Could I, could I do this? Could I just come on in here and divide by tangent? Just get rid of it. So I get A alone. What do you think, Wendy? Is that a good idea? No, Wendy doesn't approve. I don't either. But I see that mistake a lot. So I want to show it to you and talk about it. Why is that wrong? It kind of visually looks okay, but it's really wrong. Why? Why is that not okay to divide by tangent? Tangent of what? Yeah, yeah, first off, good, good question, Benjamin. Tangent of what? I mean, what does this even mean? Like a floaty tangent all by itself. Tangent of what? What are you going to, I'm going I'm to find that out. What is it? Tangent of, what, what are you going to do? Just hit the, ta put nothing on the screen and hit the tangent button? I'm not sure what it would do, right? That, that, that's meaningless, first off. Secondly, the, the other main reason that you cannot divide off tangent is because it never was multiplication all along. So you don't get rid of it by dividing. This does not mean tangent times A. That's the main thing I want to help you to see, not just for sine, cosine, tangent, but if you're going higher in math, pre-calc, calc, all the time, you'll have not only sine, cosine, tangent, but also logarithms and exponentials and all kinds of functions where you'll be tempted to think you can divide them off, but you never get rid of a function when something's plugged into a function by dividing. That won't work. Why not? Because it's not multiplication. It's tangent of A. That's why we say it that way. We don't say tangent times A. If you notice the way I talk all the time, I'm saying tangent of A. Where, where have you heard that kind of thing before? That's like saying F of X. Not F times. What does that mean? That means F... Not times x. You might think, well, yeah, but parentheses mean multiply. Not always. Not always. They sometimes do. But not here. This means f of x. Meaning, meaning what? Meaning x is plugged into the toaster. So that's why I made up that whole toaster talk when I first started teaching years ago, uh, special calculus, and I realized that people were like canceling all kinds of things they couldn't cancel. And I was like, oh, they're looking at it and they're thinking that's multiplication. That's not multiplication. That's not tangent times A. That's tangent of A. So in other words, that piece of bread on your counter is not just sitting there on the counter next to the toaster. Right? That A is not just next to tangent, so you can just divide it off. No, no. It's plugged into the toaster. That bread's not just on the counter next to the toaster. It's in the slot. You can't take it out. You'll get burnt. You'll get burnt. All right. That, that works better for you. Yeah, don't, don't, don't touch it. Yeah. So you, it's plugged into the toaster. That's why I started talking that way, just to make people think, oh, it's really, it's in there. That's not just sitting next to it, multiplication. And that's going to go for logarithms in, 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 in pre-calc, logarithm of whatever, x or whatever. You can't just divide off log, although I see that one all the time. That's not times. That's log of x. It's a function like f of x or g of x, log of x, tangent of a. Those are functions that are plugged into the toaster. Okay. So that's important to know you can't do that. So, well, if you can't do that, well, then what do you do? How do you get rid of a function then? If, if it's not multiplication, so you can't divide it, it's plugged in, how do you get it out of the toaster? And you guys have said it a couple times. Inverse tangent. Yeah. That's how you get something out of a function is you bring in the opposite function and it cancels out the main one. Like a poison and an antidote. We saw some of that yesterday, right? I say, oh, i got to get rid of that tangent. I can't just divide it. It's not multiplication. It's plugged into the toaster. But what I can do is I can say tangent inverse and tangent inverse. And this will cancel it out. 
and that'll get your A alone, which is what we want. We want to solve for A. Do you see that? that that's not just for trigonometry. You go to pre count, count, same thing with logarithms and all kinds of other functions. You do the opposite function, the inverse function, to get rid of a main function on that. I'm really confused at, like, why are we even using inverse right now? Because I, I got to get A alone. Well, I mean, if you just took the, like, sign of A, wouldn't you just do, like, opposite over hypotenuse and 13.6 okay. by 26? Sine of A. You're totally right. No, uh, let me answer your question. It's a really good question. 13.6 over 26.5. You're saying opposite over hypotenuse? Yeah. Good job. Totally right. But that's sine of A. That's not A. How do I get A now? No, no, no. That's the sign of the angle of A. I, gotta, I still have to get rid of that sign somehow. Really, you're doing the same thing with sine as we did with tangent. That's a totally good way to start. It's equally as good as our tangent way. But still, you have to get rid of the sign or get rid of the tangent because the A has to be alone. We can do 13.6 divided by 22.8. And when we get the answer, we can get the tangent of the answer. Tangent inverse. Yeah, tangent inverse. Of the answer, right. That's where we're going. Is that making sense? You all seeing that? I've got to get the A alone. I can't have a sign in front of it. I can't have a tangent in front of it. I mean, I do it first, but I got to get rid of that. So it'd be the same thing there. I'd have to do sign inverse of both sides so to get rid of that sign. So how do we do inverse like when we were finding theta angles? Like when there was theta, like where A is right now, we drew it. Usually there'd be theta there, right? And then we'd do yeah, it'd make no difference, theta. Yeah, no difference. Yeah. So the difference is on the problems number one and two. Here, I can show you start to seem alike, and you're like, what is going on? Let me show you real quick. Remember yesterday, they gave me this, 18.6 degrees right away. And then, I, then I did 90 minus 18.6 degrees, and I got 71.4 degrees. And then, and they gave me a little b right down here, 31.5. So now, when it was time to, so I didn't need any more angles. Got all the angles. They just handed them to me. And then when I wanted to find, say, like little a, and this and this, I would do tangent, right, opposite over adjacent. Tangent, 71.4 is little a over 31.5. See how that little a is not inside of a tangent or sine or cosine? He's just alone. So I didn't have to do anything inverse. Do you see the difference? Whereas this one, my a that I'm trying to get, he's an angle this time, and he's inside of a tangent. Or you could do the sine if you wanted to. Either way, you got to get that thing off the front. Got to get that sign off the front or that tangent off the front. So everybody see that? Whereas yesterday's stuff, the A was just over here. He didn't have a sign on him or a tangent on him. He was just sitting there because he was just a side. He wasn't an angle. So then I just put it over one, cross multiply, you know, get it up. See the difference? So here, it's an angle. And so you take the sine or cosine or tangent of an angle, of meaning plugged into the toaster, right? All right, so how do you get rid of that tangent? Tangent inverse, or even if you did the sine thing up here, you would do sine inverse, that would work just as well. Except we don't want to use a rounded number, but otherwise. So we get rid of the tangent by doing tangent inverse on both sides. That's how you get rid of a function, do the inverse function. Here they cancel out, what? That's what we looked at yesterday, remember? In fact, I wrote a big old table for you about when tangent inverse cancels tangent. Remember all those? specific, fine-tuned little rules that are on YouTube because Pauline saved the day and the whole lecture was recorded yesterday. So it's all on YouTube if you missed the fine-tuned details of how tangent inverse and tangent cancel, when they do, when they don't, why they do, what that means when they don't, all that, went into all that. So um, let me just briefly mention, they, they cancel when you're in the zone. huh? That's what we learned yesterday. Tangent inverse and tangent don't always cancel. But they do when you're in the zone. What was the zone for tangent? Does anybody remember? Negative pi over 2. Uh, yeah, negative 90, pi over 2 to positive 90. That was the tangent inverse. It was also the sine inverse zone, wasn't it? Negative 90 to positive 90? Well, guess what? If you're in a right triangle, you're always between 0 and 90. You're always in the zone. Did, did you follow that? Right? Because remember, a triangle holds 180, right? And that right angle is always already using up 90. So they only have 90 left for the other two. So the other two can't be over 90. Right. So you're always going to be between 0 and 90. You're always going to be in the first quadrant when you're, in, when you're an angle in a right triangle, which is what we're doing today. So when you're doing a real-life right triangle, these tangents will always cancel because you're always in the zone. Don't even worry about it. Just cancel them out.
because you're in the zone. Does that make sense? So I won't even bother with it the rest of the day. We'll just cancel them and know they cancel. So A's alone. What's the other side? Tangent inverse of 13.6 over 22.8. Hit the buttons on your calculator. Uh, I think they want you in degree mode. I want a degree answer here. So tangent inverse. Yeah, you're refining degrees. Exactly. Yep, that's the output, huh? Yeah, 30.82. I don't know how many places. Oh, yeah, right there. Why did I do that? There it is. 30.8 degrees. We got capital. You able to get that in your calculator? If you're in trouble, grab me. At the break, tangent inverse 13.6 over 22.8. So once you get A, this one's 30.8. I would just get B by subtracting from 90. Just do that. I wouldn't do any more trick stuff. Just say, hey, it's the 90 rule, right? Because the other, the A and the B have to make 90 because the right angle is using up 90. It's 180 total. So the other one I would just say 90 minus 30.8 degrees equals, what is it, 50 9.2, which is right there. And the angle C is 90. They're done. Cracks me up that they asked they for, asked for C. C. I thought so, too. I was surprised when I first saw it in my it's earlier like, is class. this a trick question? Yeah, but, yeah. And we're done with that. We got all the angles all the time. See how that's different then? When you got to find your own angles, you got to get rid of a tangent or maybe a center cosine in front of an angle. What does that? Inverse function. Keep that in mind if you're going to higher math. That's what we do all the time. When you have a function, you can't divide it it's not just next to the cat on the counter, it's in the toaster. Get rid of it with an inverse function. That's why we have inverse functions. I just spent today in pre-calculus teaching the inverse function section. That's what it was all about, is what inverse functions are, what they do, not just inverse trig, but all kinds of inverse functions. It's a big deal as you go into higher math. Applying it to the real world. Math is not real, as you know, but it applies to the real world. So here we go. Suppose we're going to do like ships and boats and things, heading and people looking at fires and firemen and rangers trying to sight in on where a fire is based on a heading or a bearing. So some of the stuff they use trigonometry for. We'll see today. You guys are getting some skills now. It's only been two weeks and you've already got pretty good tools because we're flying. You got pretty good tools to be able to do some real life stuff already. So here we go. Let's talk about what, it, what a bearing is and how they, how they give bearings. So, you're at point O, we're headed to point A. You can see the 66 degree thing. How would they write that as a bearing? Well, when they do a bearing, um, how you do a bearing, a heading, same thing, is number one, you start with north or south. You start with north or south, and that... How do you know which one? Which way are you going? You going more up or more down? Is this this line? Is it going more up or more down? I mean, I know it's diagonal in reality. It's not pure up or pure down. It's diagonal. But is it more up or more down? More up. It's it's headed northerly. Right? Northernly, whatever. However you say that. What? It's headed up. So you so we'll start with north. But then. You write the angle to east or west. So in other words, you go, we're going straight north. That's why when I write in, it means straight north, but not straight north. It's not really straight north. It's a little bit off of north, isn't it? It's a little bit east of north, huh? So we're going to write north something east. That's going to be our bearing, our heading. North something, because it's something east of north, isn't it? How much? How much to the right or the east of north is it? So that would be 90 minus 66. Just do the, yeah, they make 90. They're a right angle, huh? So this is going to be 90 degrees minus 66 degrees, 24 degrees. That good? So this little angle here must be 24 degrees. So, north 24 degrees east. Everybody see that? North 24 degrees east. That's how they want you to write it in our book. In real life, sometimes they'll say it that way, north 24 degrees east. Or they'll also say 24 degrees east of north. That's the same thing. It's another way to say the same thing. What was that? So, you were saying because it's more toward the north. Then it would be south, yeah. So, so, so had it been like maybe 5 or 10 degrees 
would it still be considered north? Oh, you mean like, you mean, Jose, if I understand you right, if it yeah. was just, just yeah. like five, just barely above? Yeah. Yeah, that's the trick. Because I would think of that as east first, huh? I would think of that as east, five degrees north. But that isn't how they want us to say them. They want us, now I don't know if it's universal or not, honestly. I just follow the math Excel thing. But they want us to say north or south first. So you can always do it that way, even when it doesn't seem all that natural. Yes, you would say north, 85 degrees east, is what you would say in that case. So you would still say north, because it's more north than south, huh? It's going up more than it's going down. So you would, you always start with north or south, and then how many degrees it is off of north or so south. The x-axis is the positive or negative. Yes. North or south. Right, okay. exactly. Or, or the y-axis, this is the y-axis. But yeah, I got you. Show yeah. me about the O. What does the O represent? Is that like... I, I Origin. Thinking, that's it. Just the starting point. Yeah. So in real life problems in a minute, it'll be where the boat starts. It'll be where the first ranger is and he's siding with the second ranger. They'll, they'll tell us. It'll be where we start. Originate. Origin. Originate. Is that good? Does that make sense? So you do north or south and then you do the degree off of north. Or you write the angle to the east or the west off of the north or south. Is this what or south. Use or something like that? You know, I'm not really sure. I bailed out of engineering when you think of so I'm not sure stuff yeah I think it looks interesting what they're doing yeah. but I... all right so write the bearing on that one. so remember you got to start with north or south even though that one's mainly west huh but you got to start with north or south and then write the angle east or west So is this one north or south? south. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going south more than it's going north. It's going down and left, not up and left, huh? So you would say south, some kind of degree, west, huh? Because it's going south, but it's west of south. How much? Well, it's just the 80. I don't need to mess with it at all. 80 is the angle off of the south. So it's always measured off of the y-axis. Yeah, which is exactly the opposite of reference angles, huh? Have you noticed that? Maybe that'll help. It's exactly the opposite of how we do a reference angle. Reference angles are always off the x-axis. Why? Because zero degrees, they decided to make zero degrees on the x-axis. But for bearing, again, this is just a their decision, they decided to make north-south the main thing, so we're always off of that. They could have made it east-west. See, I thought it was. I thought it was using the angle that was closest to the west or the east. So I. Oh, no, closest, closest to the west. It's it's the it's the angle off of the north south line. So you're going. So you're saying we're going south, but not straight south. Eighty degrees west of south. That's what that means. Yeah. So is the answer always going to be less than ninety for this one. Oh yeah. Well said. Always less than ninety. So you can't like go to the other y-axis. No. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, no. I don't know. So every time we start from south, it's always going to be the angle? No. No, they could. Let me show you one where it's not. If they would have given you this, say, as 10 degrees, I would have, what, what would I have called that? Here's north, south, east, and west. What if they'd given it to me like that? It would still be the same. It's still south, south, but I, I need that angle. So it'd be 90 minus 10, 80 degrees. That's the same angle given to me a different way. So it's always the angle. You eventually, when you write the answer, the answer is always the angle off the north-south line. So in this case, they directly gave me the angle off the north-south line, 80 degrees. And this problem right here, I would be giving you the angle off the x line, so you'd have to find the angle off the north-south line. Make sense? Yeah. We always give north or south first. And then the angle off the north-south line. Sometimes they hand us that silver platter. Sometimes we got to work for it. All right, so that's bearing. We're going to use that. Okay, what is simple harmonic motion? Does anybody know what simple harmonic motion is? It means a sine curve or a cosine curve. It's all the same thing, right? Just shifted. So simple harmonic motion is, is exactly what, remember I've been saying all along, 
The, all this stuff is useful for any time things go up and down, up and down, up and down. I've got, a, I've got an interesting example for you. No, it's the Blu-ray. I don't have a Blu-ray movie for you. Sorry. Elmo. There we go. So, can you see that? No. Oh, there we go. We'll get the light. That doesn't look very harmonic. That's 1989, <coughs> Oakland, California. Two hours, what, three hours from here. Do you remember that? Look, look, do you see, see what's going on here? You see that? You see how the highway is a sine curve? <laughs> right? Do you remember that? Do you remember when that happened? What's that? And then, oh, yeah, it's over, hopefully. Oh, 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 no, I think you can see yeah, that. I don't know if I'd stand on it. Do you guys don't remember when that, do you remember when that happened? Yeah. In Oakland? Was it one in Los Angeles, 94? Okay, I don't remember that one. This, what's that? No, it was born in 96. No, exactly. <laughs> you don't remember that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 96, wow. I was born a little earlier. All right. <laughs> 60s. 60s. All right. Don't tell them. I'll just keep it a secret. All right. So, um, all right. So, um, it was, you guys remember what it was in the middle of? I don't remember. I, I, lived, I wasn't there, but. It was the middle of the World Series. And, it was, and the World Series that year was between Oakland and San Francisco. It was called the Bay Series. I mean, the whole World Series was just, they would, you know, once, once they were done at one stadium, they would drive 20 minutes to the other stadium to play the next game. I mean, it was right, it was Oakland A's and San Francisco Giants in the World Series. The only time I remember those two teams playing in the World Series. And the earthquake happened, like, after game three or something. Like, right, it was like, kind of, they had, and they had to put off the World Series by a day. And the A's had this... Um, Awesome pitcher. Who was it? What was his name? Anybody have Google? Have been 1989 World. It was 1989, I believe. 1989 World Series. Who was that pitcher? Was that the one-handed pitcher? No, no, not the Giants had him for a while. No, this this guy was just uh, just unstoppable. And so what it did, the fact he pitched Game One for the A's and iced the Sorry if you're a Giants fan. They didn't win. They went down in four straight games. It didn't last long. The, the A's pitcher iced them in the first game. They scored like zero or one. And then they played game two, played game three. And he would not have been able to come in in game four in the normal rotation. He would rest his arm. But then the earthquake happened. So they put off the World Series by a day or two. And that meant he got to rest. So he came back in in game four again, iced them, World Series over. The earthquake affected the outcome of the World Series. Did you find it? With Mike Moore, Dave Stewart. Oh, Stewart. Wasn't it Stewart? Dave Stewart. Wasn't he on the A's, the A's pitcher that won the games? I played game three again. Stewart, I don't know, maybe I'm... Yeah, so yeah, Stewart has two games, huh? Yeah. Yeah, oh, it looks like he pitched game one and three. Yeah, he shut him out completely to zero, yeah. The A's in four straight games. Yeah, and he was able to pitch game one and three. Now, normally a pitcher would never pitch back that soon, but the world, but the, but the highway... So anyway, so I'm getting off track now. I think the baseball thing here. It was interesting to me that, uh, that that happened. So yeah, right there during the world, or right after game three, I think it was, or game two or something, the, uh, it happened. So anyway, um, in the earth, simple harmonic motion, like on the ocean, right? You see those sine curves flipping on the ocean as the moon pulls the water, right? It causes the sine curves. Well, the same thing happens in the soil of the earth at different times, those earthquakes, they are actually sine curves, and we see it erupting here. So, anyway, that's called simple harmonic motion. And so, we can predict it with a sine curve. So, whenever they say simple harmonic motion, that's the science word for sine curve. Anything going up and down, up and down, up and down. So, that's a sine curve. Let's think about a sine curve. Well, actually, this one's cosine, huh? And you know there's no difference, right? Like, if I went back to that picture... I went back to that picture and said, hey, was that one a sine curve or a cosine? Well, it's both. It's just where it starts, right? It's up and down, up and down. It makes no difference. So cosine, so they give me a cosine here. You guys know how to graph 5 cosine 2 pi t, right? How do we graph 5 cosine 2 pi t? We had graphing of sines and cosines a couple days ago, right? Where, where, uh, cosine looks like what? Where does cosine start? S1. 
starts high, in this case five, right on the money. Yeah, my cosine's a big U. Remember my cosine's a big U, he starts high, in high. Whereas sine, sine starts in the middle, goes high, low, back to the middle. So this one would start at five, because yeah, that's the amplitude. Go down and back up to five, wouldn't you? So that's that cosine curve. I don't know what the period is, I'm gonna mess with that right now. But well, actually they're gonna, I'm gonna do it in a minute. But um, for now, that's what it would generally look like, right? Well, their first question to me, what is the maximum displacement? Maximum displacement. Physics loves to use that word, displacement. That means distance from the middle. Whenever they say displacement, it's how far moved from the middle, from where it normally sits. That's displacement. Distance moved. So, if I went back here to the um, freeway in Oakland, how far are the, is the freeway moved? It'd basically be from where the freeway originally was to now how it's humped up because of the sine curve. How far up that is. That would be the displacement of it. This is your actual physical book, by the way, that I'm... Well, how do we know that the hump isn't the original and it was a sag? Yeah, you'd have to look at the original plans, huh? Yeah, that's right. Afterwards, it's hard to tell what was going on, huh? Yeah, so that's what we mean by max displacement. So therefore, if I'm defining that as max displacement, if that's what it is, then you know what it is in this one? It's the five. It's another word for amplitude, in other words. Max displacement is a fancy word for amplitude. It's f how far off of the start, how far off of the zero. So it's just amplitude. These are the real life words they use. They don't say sine curve, they say simple harmonic motion. And they don't say amplitude, they say max displacement, right? That's the highest it'll ever be is five, right? It goes lower than that. The highest point on the freeway would be maybe five feet above. I don't know what the reality was. Um, okay, and then on to part B. B is asking for frequency. So we have some simple harmonic motion, and they're asking for frequency. Now, what is frequency? If you look at the rest of the, there it is. So they want, so they're saying, what's the frequency in cycles per second? You know, uh, we're doing physics now, that's what we're doing. And I, I thought physics was the hardest thing I've ever taken. Uh, especially at junior college. The hardest thing when I was in junior college, student like y'all, I was doing this too, taking you know math and science. I took physics, chemistry, all the math and computer computer classes up. Anyway, I just knew I wanted to do something in that area. And anyway, physics was the hardest. Physics was like math with all word problems. That's what it felt like to me. And I remember taking my physics class and being very confused at many points. And I'd read these crazy big old word problems, and I would just think, oh man. What am I supposed to do with that? And then I started noticing units. And units, which I used to disregard and kind of bugged me, which they weren't there before, I started noticing that if I paid attention to units, they would often guide me as to what to do to solve the problem. Units became my friends. They became the light in the dark word problem. So, I, so pay attention to units. They can help you. Cycles per second. Cycles per second. Hey, let's do this. Actually, I have an easier way. Let's jump on to C. Let's jump on to C and we'll come back to B. I think it'll be easier that way. Let's jump on to C. Time required for one cycle. Time required for one. Let me, let me draw the cosine again. Starts high, right at five. Down and up. That, that'd be one cycle, huh? Let's do another one. Down and up. That's another cycle. Then, you know, go again. Down and up. And on you go, right? That's three cycles. Um, time, and, and, and did you notice that the x-axis here is time? Time in seconds. Did you see that right here? It says uh, seconds. T is measured in seconds. And this is 5 cosine 2 pi t. T is like my x. It's my, and that's what, in physics problems, time is always the x-axis. Almost always. So time is the x-axis. So when they say to me in question C, time for one cycle, they want to know how far from here to here. One cycle, huh? How much time for one cycle? How wide is one cycle? 
What's that? No, I said the period. Yes, that's exactly what I want you to say. Great, Jose. Yeah, everybody seen that? That's what we called period yesterday or the day before, sometime this week. It was this week, I'm sure. Right? It, period. That's period. That's fancy word for period. Right? This, this is the, the one cycle, cycle, the width of one cycle, that's called period. How long one cycle takes, that's period. So on question C, when they say time for <laughs> one cycle, they're saying period. We know a period formula. What is it? 2 pi over B. Pi over B. That's all we got to do. That's what period is, the time for one cycle, the width of one cycle. That's called period. So 2 pi over B, 2 pi over, what's B? Remember, A is 5. The ABC is up in the original formula, right? B is the 2 pi. So B is 2 pi. Grab that and lean down there. 2 pi over 2 pi, 1. 1 what? If you know, but I had a physics, I had a, when I was in, one of my, one of my physics teachers if you ever gave the answer 1 or 10 or 13 or anything like that, and you just give it like that, 13, one. Mr. Grimes, he would go, what is that? Here in 13 what? He wouldn't like, he wouldn't like the answer 1 alone or 13 alone or 10 alone. He wants the units. They're all into the units. He'd be like, 13 what? He'd always say, 13 dogs? Is that 13 dogs in the kennel? What is that 13? 13 what? So 1 what? What is that? 1... Second. It's seconds. It's time. Right? Remember, it's time. Time for one cycle. One second. We're saying that this thing goes down and up in one second, doesn't it? It does a whole cycle every second, we're saying. See how we're making this real? All right, now let's back up to part B. Part B says, what's the frequency? Frequency. Frequency. Now, it's helping me by giving me these units. Frequency is cycles per second. So one cycle per second? Yeah. Do you realize it's just the upside down of period? Do you see it in the units? What, what was period again? What was period? It was, it was time per one cycle, right? Time for one cycle. Wasn't that period? Period's time for one cycle. What's frequency? Cycles per time, or seconds, if you want. Seconds, or, you know, seconds is time. Time is seconds in this one. So it was seconds. You know, period was seconds per cycle. And frequency, they're saying, is cycles per second. It's upside down. That's what frequency is. It's just upside down a period. You can see it in the units. Instead of seconds for a cycle, it cycles in a second. Like they're saying to us, how many cycles does it get done every second? Well, in this case, it's just one, because the upside down of one is one. It gets done one cycle every second. So it's kind of funny, because the answer is one. And normally, it'd be something like three, and then it'd be a third, you know? Three cycle, three seconds, for, and then one third of a cycle every second, or something like that. But it's just one and one in this case. Are we good with all that? Does that make sense? The real-life application of all that? So frequency is the upside down of period. If you go into physics, you do a lot of that. A lot of that kind of thing. You know the old story about when they, when they first landed on the moon? When was that, 60s? I'm guessing. First landed on the moon, there was a physicist watching on TV, the astronauts walking around on the moon, it was being you know, broadcast, and one of them was carrying something, um, some kind of bag or stick or something like that, and it was rotating as he walked along back and forth like this on the moon. And did you know, what, what is that right there? That simple harmonic motion. That back and forth, back and forth, high and low, high and low. It was making simple harmonic motion as the person walked around on the moon. And from that, there's equations in physics, basically these kind of equations with sines and cosines and stuff, that depend on the gravity, right? The stronger the gravity where you're at, the, the more it'll pull down faster. It'll make the motion go faster. So on the Earth, you know, we have stronger gravity than the moon, right? Moon is about one-sixth our gravity because it's smaller. So on the Earth, if you had the same stick, same distance, same initial height, and you went like that, it's going to go faster on the Earth because the Earth's gravity pulls down. When the stick is out like here, the gra Earth's gravity is pulling it back down here faster and then 
back down here faster. Whereas if you're on the moon with one sixth the gravity, it would it would go slower because when it's up, it's being pulled down slower. Well, the person was watching, the physicist was watching the motion as the astronaut walked around on the moon, and he was able to quickly calculate the gravity of the moon based upon the simple harmonic motion of it. Anyway, so it's all related. Physics. I like physics. I have great respect for physicists. All right, so let's move on. Not much, but it's got a different number there. Okay, so the formula they're giving me is D equals one-fifth sine 2t. Notice it's not 2 pi t this time. See the difference? It's 2t. So, all right, uh, what's the max displacement? One-fifth. One-fifth. That's just amplitude, right? Part B, what's the... Uh, not the period. What's the... Well, let, yeah, let's jump to part C and find the period first. What's the period? 2 pi, two pi over B. So 2 pi over... What's the B? Here's the A, the B. It's 2. 2 pi over 2 pi. Period's pi. Mm -hmm. We good? And what's the frequency then? 1 over pi. 1 because it's upside down. We're done. So I want to show you how quick that all is. You, now that we know all those facts. Frequency is 1 over the period. It's upside down in the period. We good on that? So frequency, let me just write the frequency formula then. Frequency is B over 2 pi. It's upside down, right? Period is 2 pi over B, as you already know. I'm going to be in, at the tutoring center tomorrow. That's right, Friday. 10 to 1. So You're leaving us already? Are you getting bored with this? She's seen this once or twice or maybe three times now. <laughs> yeah, good, great. Yes. Thanks, Wynn. So Wendy's here on Friday, 10 to 1, right? Yes. 10 to 1. Extra credit for going to Wendy or to anybody else in that tutoring center. Write a point an hour, 20 points, almost half a grade. And the tutoring center closes at 2 p.m. Friday. Okay. 9 to 2 or something? 10 to 2? Uh, I think it's 8 to 2. 8. Okay, thanks. 8 to 2. Thanks, Wendy. Bye. All right, so we good? So we get the formula for period. It's just upside down for frequency. There it is. All right. How can we find that x here on problem number? These are applications, real life shapes, trying to find sides and stuff. How can we find x there? There's like two triangles. Good. What do you all think? How can we find that x? Well, they split it into two 90-degree angles. Or yeah. Triangles. Yeah. So it makes sense? We'll just do it in two parts, huh? Did you all see that? <laughs> I'll call this maybe Y, and, and this part maybe Z or whatever. And I'll just find Y and find Z and add them up, and that'll be X. So everybody see that game plan? Just add the Y and add the <coughs> Z, and they, they have to total X. X is them added together. And so let's do that. So, okay. So how are we going to find Y first off? How are we going to find Y? Good, yeah, because this is the hypotenuse. This is the opposite. This is the adjacent. The so Katoa. So Katoa, yeah. So opposite over adjacent. This angle here, opposite is y, adjacent to the 490. Everybody seeing that? So the tangent of 46 is y over 490. Everybody good there? Tangent of 46 degrees is y over 490. So how could I solve that equation for y? Uh, one over, uh, 490 over 1. Yeah, so we just, I, we just cross multiply usually, right? When we have a fraction on one side, just diagonal, diagonal, and we'll get that, yeah. Cross multiply. So we get 490 tangent 46 is 1 times y. Now, um, on this problem in the blue there, they say don't round off until the end. Well, I mean, you could do that, but 
it'd be easier to go ahead and figure out an answer now. Just use more digits than you need in the end, and it'll be okay. What do we need? If you, it's off the screen, but if you look at the blue line, it, it wants the nearest whole number, I believe, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So since they want a whole number, I'm going to use a couple of decimal places while I'm in the middle of the problem, and then at the end, I'll be able to accurately round. Because of those digits after the decimal have an and effect. More than one, yeah. Like so yeah, it could be a problem if you don't use a couple more digits. So Five, four. Seven point four oh nine three five three. Is that what it is? Yeah. Five oh seven. I'll just go with point four one. That's good enough accuracy. In the end, they just want whole numbers. So I'm just going to go a couple places more. Okay, we got Y. Can you get Z now? Same, same thing, huh? Exactly. Going to use that same 490. I'm going to use Z, 490, and the 20. This is the hypotenuse. This is the opposite. This is the adjacent. So it's tangent again, isn't it? Tangent of 20 is opposite over adjacent. Z over 490. Same-o, same-o. So uh, put this one, diagonal, diagonal, 490... Tan 20. One seventy eight point thirty five. Yeah. Thank you. We good, and then we just add those together, don't we? We just add those together. And round it off. up and round, what am I getting, 686 when I rounded it, 685.7, so rounds to 686. So X must be, X must equal 686 to the nearest whole number. Is that easy enough? Just two triangles, tangent twice, add them up. Questions? All is well. All right, I'm going to move on if you're good. If you're good, I'm good. All right, so trying to find, we want to find X there. X, is X, um, yeah, let me give you a second to think about it. You've got to try. See if you can find X there. I don't see how that would tell you the other angle. I see, I see what you mean about 90 minus 69. Go ahead and do that. That's, that could be helpful. But both of the other angles can form like 180 because the other angles like... <coughs> oh, yeah, nice. You're right. You could find them. I don't think it'll go anywhere else, but uh, that's true. You could find and all of them. Then you can use one of like sine, cosine, or tangent to find the... Thing. Yeah, what, what's the big game plan? What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. To, to find um to find this side here? Yeah. Right. When you get that, you Call that Y or whatever. Mm -hmm. To find this whole thing, which we could call Z, and then subtract them. Exactly. That's the game plan. You see the problem? The re that's exactly how we have to do it. We have to do this one indirectly. We cannot get X directly. Why not? Because X is not a side in a right triangle. Do you see that? Does everybody see how you think? Well, no, it's right there. Yeah, it's a side of a triangle, but it's not in a right triangle, is it? See how X is the bottom of a non-right triangle? 
COX is the bottom of a triangle that does not have a 90 degree angle. So what? Is that a problem? That's a big problem. We can't use our Sokotoa stuff. Why not? Because sine is opposite over what? Hypotenuse. Sine, number sine, is opposite over hypotenuse. There's no hypotenuse when there's no right angle. There's no right angle there. So there's no hypotenuse, right? So you, all of our trick stuff that we've been doing, all of our Sokotoa has to be in a right triangle. I don't know if that struck you before, but let's let that sink in real clear at this point. That'll really help you. Is everybody tracking with me? If they give me a triangle, if they give me some kind of triangle like this one, they go, here you go. Well, that sort of looks like the right one. If they give me some kind of triangle like this one, and they say, hey, this is 7, this is 11, find the other side. I have no idea. I can't use my Sokotoa trig stuff because there's no right angle in there. There's no 90 degree angle in that triangle. Once you create one. You can maybe do some fancy stuff. But directly, we can't. Does everybody understand that? All the Sokotoa stuff we've been doing, cycles and tangent is only for right triangles. We gotta have a 90 degree angle in there. So that's why we cannot directly try to get that X because he's in a triangle. He's the bottom of a triangle that's not a right triangle. So instead, instead of doing that, we have to say, well look, we can get Y because that's the bottom of a small right triangle. And then we can get Z because that's the bottom of a big right triangle and subtract them to get X. Jose? No, I was saying could you get uh, the angles up on the top? We don't need to. You could, but they're just and not helpful. And you could use the Sokotoa? We can use Sokotoa with the angles they've already given us. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to find other angles. Once they've given us are good enough. No, no, it'll give you the side. Oh. It'll give you the side. Okay. Give you what? If you get the angles up on top, right. which is 21, and, uh, the total angle is 59 degrees. Okay. 59 degrees. And then you can do a, a, a tangent. Right. Tangent of 59 would give you opposite over adjacent. That's true, but I could just take the 31 right now and do tangent, and it's 260 over Z. Okay. So I just don't need, it's just extra work not needed. Yeah, I don't need to find, although it's true what you're saying, that will work that way, but I've already got everything I need. So I'm just going to go forward with the angles I've already got. So this is why the whole bottom is Z. So here we go. Let's find the Y. So I need a, I'm just doing the small triangle right now, right? Just doing the small triangle. How are we going to find Y? We need a trig relationship involving the 260, the Y, and the 69. What's it going to be? Tangent, because this is opposite over adjacent. That's hypotenuse, huh? Because across from the right angle. See how there's always got to be a right angle? So the tangent of... 69 degrees is 260 over what? Opposite over adjacent. I just made up the names Y and Z there for solving purposes. So everybody see that? Tangent 69 is 69 degrees is 260 over Y. All right. So now I need to, I put a 1 underneath that. You know how to solve, right? We always, whenever we have a fraction, we... We cross, put under 1, and cross multiply. So we get y tangent 69 degrees Negative. equals 1 times 260. And then to solve for y, we divide by tangent 69 degrees. Y equals 99.80. Yeah, 99.80. Good so far, that's Y. Now let's find Z. Z is the entire denominator. So I go, okay, this was Y. Now I want to find Z. I'm looking at the whole triangle now. The whole triangle. And I'm going to use the 31 degrees. This is opposite. This whole side down here is adjacent. 
This is hypotenuse for the whole triangle, isn't it? So what do I have? I have tangent again. Seems like it's always tangent today. Tangent of 31 degrees equals opposite 260 over adjacent Z. Tangent of 31 degrees is 260 over Z. Same thing. Put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal. Z tangent 31 degrees is 1 times 260. Last step, divide by tangent 31. Is that what it is? Yep, good. So Z equals... 432.71. So what do we do now? We have Z, which is all the way, the whole bottom, Y, which is just this little piece right here. So how do we find X? Minus 99 degrees. Yeah, subtract them, huh? Difference. 332.9. They want me to round to the nearest whole number. 333. We got X. Does that make sense? We had to do direct, X indirectly because X was the bottom of a non-right triangle. So we could not work with that triangle on the right. It wasn't a right triangle. We, instead, we had to work with the little triangle because that was a right triangle and the whole triangle because that's a right triangle. Find the two different bottoms and subtract them. So anytime you're asked to do something with a triangle that's not a 90 degree angle, you have to create you have a to 90 somehow, degree angle. Yeah. And then Maybe. Later next, next week. It's never long here. Next week or the week after, we'll get some special rules for non-right triangles. Law of sides, law of cosines. Okay. We'll get some rules. But yeah, for all the Sokotoa stuff, you've got to have right angles. Because we're always talking about hypotenuse, right. which means you've got to have a right angle. That's the side opposite the right angle. If you don't have a right angle, you don't have a hypotenuse. So Katoa falls apart. All right. All right, so here we go. I, I'd blow it up, but uh, the words go off the screen. Tallest television transmitting tower in the world is in North Dakota. Did you know that? I did not know that. It doesn't really matter a lot to me. From a, from a point on level ground, 5,280 feet, that's exactly one mile, from the base of the tower, the angle of elevation is 28.7 degrees. Approximate the height of the tower to the nearest foot. So they're giving us the 5280 is the hypotenuse? So let me, let me write out bigger so you can read it, the crucial facts. Um, 5,280 feet off from the base on, on the ground... To, 5,280 feet on the ground from the base from the base angle angle of elevation to the top is a 20 oops Twenty-eight point seven degrees. So, we're five thousand two hundred eighty feet on the ground. So that's distance from me. Do so what you can do. Let me let you draw. Rather than me just whip it out, you draw it. See what you can get, and then I'll draw. Because that's a lot of the battle is drawing these things out. It's going to be a triangle, huh? You know, it's going to be a triangle. It's going to be a right triangle. We have a tower. We're trying to find the height of that tower without climbing it from the ground can you figure out the height of that tower by angles and stuff so there's 5,280 feet on the ground from the base that's where the person is standing 5,280 feet on the ground from the base and the angle of elevation is 28.7 degrees and you want to find the height of the tower so can you do that Height of the tower that way. Well, the first part is confusing. 
on the ground from the base. Yeah, so that's where you are standing. I, I should get more of this. You are standing. You are standing 5,200 feet on the ground from the base of the tower. So there's this tower, and you're standing 5,280 feet on the ground from the base, the bottom of the tower. So this is a tower, and you're standing, this is the ground, this is you, oh, horizontal okay. on the ground, right? On the ground, from the base. Is that making sense? So 5,280 feet on the ground from the base, and the angle of elevation, 28.7 degrees. Everybody see that? Are you comfortable with, a, with an angle of elevation? That means from horizontal up, doesn't it? How far do you have to elevate above horizontal? That's called an angle of elevation. So 28.7 degrees, that's how far above level... So there's flat ground and then 28.7 up. So they have instruments where you can, now they do it with lasers, where you can basically stand somewhere. So this is the way they can measure the height of this tower without climbing it. They would stand a certain distance away from the tower. This is exactly one mile, 5,200 feet. They would take a laser thing and they would aim it up, 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 up until it aimed at the top of the tower. And then they would look at that angle or the machine would tell you what angle it's at. That's called the angle of elevation. So with just the ground distance and the angle, you can figure out how tall that tower is. So let's call it X. What trig relationship have we been using all day? Tangent. Tangent again. It's the tan Thursdays are for tangent, I guess. Um, so yeah, because it's, again, opposite over adjacent. There's my right angle. Assuming this is not the leaning tower of Pisa. It's a tower that goes straight up. Got a right angle, and the hypotenuse is here. So I need opposite over adjacent. So tangent of 28.7 degrees is x over 5280, right? Opposite over adjacent, x over 5280. So then um, you know how to solve for x. We've done it a bunch. Put a, put a 1 underneath it and cross multiply. 5280 tangent 28.7 degrees is 1 times x. Hit the button. What it is? Yep. 2890. I don't know how far. Nearest foot. So 2890.7. So we'll just say 2891. It's 2891 feet tall. Tallest television tower. In the world. It's just confusing the way they, the way they uh, word it. 2280 on the ground from the base. Well, that was my like, word. It sounds like you're standing right next to the. Yeah, they, they said it better. I just didn't want to write all those words out. They said the tallest television transmitting tower in the world is in North Dakota from a point on level ground, 5,208 feet, one mile from the base of the tower. The angle of elevation is 28.7. So, they said it a little better. Okay. Is that making sense? You good at drawing that picture? Find that out? Questions on that one? All right, I'm going to move along. So, let's see if we can finish this up. All right, so I'd make it bigger, but it got off the screen. So, boat leaves in, uh, the entrance to a harbor, travels 200 miles on a bearing of north, 54. So, we're back to the bearing stuff. We're going to actually do something with it now. So, um, here goes the boat. So, the boat travels... The boat travels 200 miles, 200 miles, on a bearing north, 54 degrees east. And the question is, how far, um, how many miles north, and how many miles, how far north and east does it go? How far north and how far east does it go? So let me let you draw the picture because that's a lot of the battle. I don't want to just do that and have you not learn anything. So try that on your own. See if you can draw. Let me, let me give you a good way to start. Um, I, I think it's helpful. Oh, my pencil went, went dead. Sorry. 
I gotta charge my pencil. I don't think there's any way to do that. What what if I could use this tricky little thing here? No, I don't think that'll work. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. Let's see if that charges my pencil. I'm trying to use this for everything now, Pauline. You you, you changed my whole life. It's all working out now. Too bad you couldn't connect that to the cord so you could still use it while you use it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that connection works. Oh, wait a minute. I can use this little thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I can do it. Yeah, anyway, so go <laughs> ahead. Yeah, there, I got this other special thing, which I never use. But now, now I'm starting to look at my stuff and think, I should, I should look at this stuff. It does things. The Apple guys would be so, so sad that I'm not aware of how to use their equipment. Yeah, there you go. That's doing it. All right. Yeah, can you use it while it's charging on the cord? I probably could, yeah. It's long enough. Yeah. Wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, yeah, so draw. Start by drawing. Oh, is it, is it going to work? Uh-oh. Oh, maybe I need it. Does it need a minute? Start by drawing an axis system. <laughs> that means it. Draw the north-south, east-west. So draw, draw a coordinate system, and then see if you can take it from there. Quick question about the bearings. I noticed every bearing problem we came across, like, we always had to subtract it from 90. Like all the time. Is that like a? Is that like not all the time? Remember one of them we did it. Remember, so it's not always. It's not always. Remember one of them back here. That one. It was just straight eighty. So so bearing is off of the north or south. That's the that's the crucial thing. So if they give you right off of the north or south, you don't have to subtract from ninety. But in the one before it, they gave me off of the east west. So I had to subtract to find the 24 off of the north. So bearing is always off of north or south. So if they give you off of east or west, then yes, you have to subtract. But if they just directly hand you right off of north or south, just take it. Well, I thought that was off of uh, west too. Is that off of west or anything? Well, see this 80 here? Mm -hmm. They're showing me the 80 from this. See the, the black, you see the black underneath my thing there? See that? No, oh, yeah, my pencil's not working. I don't know. It just doesn't seem to like that. Or maybe it just didn't maybe, sync up. I don't maybe know what it is. It just doesn't like to be plugged in while you're using it. Maybe it has to be charged and not plugged in. Maybe. I don't know. So draw that access system. Because some things, when you plug them in, don't like to be used while they're charging. They won't work while they're charging. Oh. Some things don't. Maybe it is that. Maybe it is. So try drawing that axis system. Draw that on there. All right, that should be enough. They advertise 30 seconds for 30 minutes usage. So, yeah, it's working. All right, so yeah, draw that axis system. So here's the boat, where the boat started, right in the center. And we have north, south, east, and west. Okay, so the boat's going 200 miles north, 54 degrees east. So, so do you, are you getting comfortable with the bearing thing? So north, that's straight up. Start with that. That's what they start with, north. But it's not just pure north. It's what? 54 degrees to the east of north. Remember, that's off of the north off of the north towards the east. That angle is, it's always the angle given off of the north or south. So it's actually going to go like that. 54 degrees. Everybody see that? So this is really where the boat's headed. Let's say the boat ends here. So the boat headed north, 54 east, and it did a total of 200 miles in that direction. Is that picture making sense? Mm -hmm. You able to get that picture? That's what they're saying. The boat was headed north, but not straight north, 54 east, 200 miles. It went, it went a distance of 200 miles away. Now, what's the, what do they want from me? Okay, great, there's a picture. What do they want? The boat ends here, and they want to know, hey, how far east... And how far north? That'd be, that'd be how far east, it's a right angle here, and how far north did the boat go in that trip? How much easterly 
travel did it do? How much northerly, northernly travel did it do? How far east? How far north did it go? Chapter 90, then do the little sign sign for one equal sign for the other. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we got to find this angle right here in the triangle. That means 90 minus 54. Yep, 36. 30. Now we have an angle in the triangle, 36 degrees. And we can use our Sokotoma stuff because that is a right triangle, isn't it? It's a right triangle. So try that. Take it from there. Find what you need to find. Okay, so I want something. Let me do the, what, north first. So I need north and 200, and I'm using 36 degrees. So what trig relation? Yeah, we're finally done with tangent, huh? So Katoa. So Katoa. I need, what is this? Opposite and hypotenuse. Yeah, that's sine. So the sine of 36 degrees is opposite north over hypotenuse 200, huh? So that's how I'll find out how much north, norther, how much north, how far north the boat went. The boat went diagonal, but in that it went right and north, east and north. How far north did it go? Well, let's see. Put this over one, diagonal, diagonal, 200 sine 36 degrees is one times in, so north is whatever. Yep, 117, and I don't know how far, tenth of a mile, so 0. 0.6, they want me to round to tenth of a mile. 117.6, that's how far north the, bo the boat went in its diagonal travel. And then to find out how far east the boat went, yep, it's going to be cosine, huh? Because you want east and 200, that's adjacent in hypotenuse, that's cosine. So cosine, 36 degrees, is east over 200. 161.80. And over 1, cross multiply, 200. Cos 36 degrees is east. What was that, 181? 161.80. So we want 0.8. 161.8, that what you all got? 4. East. That's how far east the boat went. Now for the second, uh, for east, even though you, you could you use tangent, it won't give you accurate because they're rounded, right? Yeah, you don't want to use a rounded number. You want to use a given one. You want to give a number this, yeah, given. Exactly. Does that make sense? See, very practical question there, right? If a boat heads off and it's some kind of a diagonal, how can we figure out exactly where it is on a grid? How far east, how far north? Did it exactly go? The next problem after the break, we're going to do a couple of rangers sighting in on a fire. They're going to give their bearings, and we'll be able to nail down exactly where that fire is based upon what they say, how the distance to the fire, based upon what they say with bearings, another practical use. Let's take... All right, we good? You ready to pick it up with the forest ranger? <clears throat> the forest ranger. Sites of fire directly to the south. So I would right away draw my axis system. Here's the forest ranger. I'll call this the first ranger. Okay. And he, here's the, you know, the north, south, east, and west. See if you can take it from there. See if you can put the information. Can you read all that? The forest ranger sights a fire directly to the south. What else? I can't read. Oh, yeah. Directly to the south. The second ranger is seven miles east of the first ranger.
And so the forest ranger sets a fire directly to the south. So that would so I would put the fire down here, directly south of the first ranger. Is that good? Is it hard to see all those words? I'm getting old. I can uh, I have terrible close vision, but my far vision's okay. But I can't see when they're close. Kids are always showing me their cell phone. Dad, look at this. That was good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Question? Uh, do we draw, like, between uh, the southeast or do we draw to the yeah, okay, so, yeah, the next part says, okay, so, uh, the second, I'll write it up here, the second ranger is seven miles east of the first ranger. So the second ranger is seven miles east of the first ranger. So the second one is, is over here. So here's the second ranger. And this distance is seven from there to there. Is that making sense? The second ranger is seven miles east of the first ranger. And he also sights the fire. Now, here's the crucial thing. The bearing of the second ranger to the fire is south 35 degrees west. So we have to draw another as northeast with for the second ranger and then draw diagonal. Does that help you? Sure. Yeah, does everybody see what it stands? So so we have the first ranger and the fire is directly south. We don't know how far. Doesn't say. The first ranger just saying, I see the fire south of me, directly south of me. And the other ranger goes east seven miles, and he spots the fire also. This is like triangulization. So they, there's this fire. The first ranger stands in position, so the fire is directly south of him. The other ranger says, I'm going to head directly east seven miles, and then I'm going to sight the fire with my laser thing and get the angle. Now, what is it saying about the second ranger? The bearing of the second ranger to the fire is south 35 degrees west. What does that mean? Yeah, if you want to put another axis system here, you could. For the second ranger, this is his north, south, east, and west. What is it saying? For him to point at the fire, which is right here, by the way, right? For him to point, this is his bearing to the fire. For the second ranger to point at the fire, he is south. Isn't that straight south? South, but not just south, south. 35 degrees west, so he goes this way, 35 degrees. That angle must be 35. Does that make sense? The second ranger's bearing to the fire is south, but 35 west of south. South, 35 west. And then the question, how far is the first ranger from the fire? What is this X here? That's what they want to know. So this is called triangulization. This is how with two people both sighting something using trigonometry, so we got some skills now. With two people both sighting something, we can figure out how far away it is. By both of them sighting and giving their angle of sight. This makes sense with the, how I got this picture, right? Fires do so, well the ranger stand, first ranger stands, so the fire is straight south of him. The other goes east seven miles. He sights the fire. His bearing is south, 35 degrees west. So now we have a triangle. This is a right triangle, so we can use that. That's why the, fire, the ranger headed straight east, huh? And the fire is straight south. They made a right angle, didn't they? They purposely made a right angle. See how that works? See how that triangulization works? So they perfectly made a right angle there. If you heard of that, you know, and... Before, where they say, you know, triangulate it. Well, this, this is it. This is triangulization. We're finding where something is by making a triangle with two people sighting it. So it doesn't matter how far he goes, as long as he goes in a straight line. Right, exactly. Then the fire's got to be straight south of him, and he's got to go straight east so that you get a right angle there. 
Because we've got to have a right angle to use our Sokotoa stuff, huh? So yeah, but they, they do that. The, the ranger just moves till he's straight south of it, and the other ranger goes directly east. So they're making a right angle there. All right, so now we want to find X in that triangle. We want to find out how far is it to the fire from the first ranger. So you can call it in and say the fire is this far away and let the authorities know. So how do we find X there? What am I going to do? Yeah, first I got to get an angle inside our triangle, don't I? This 35 is outside of my triangle. I got to get this angle in my triangle, yeah. So you got to go, okay, so this angle here is going to be 90 degrees minus 35. So it's going to be 55 degrees there. So now I have an angle inside the triangle. And then, yeah, so what's it going to be? This is... Opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse. Which trig relationship? So, Katoa, which trig relationship? Back to tangent again. I only left tangent for a short season. Back to tangent again. Tangent, 55 degrees. Opposite over adjacent, x over 7. There it is. Now we can solve for the x, right? Put this over 1, diagonal, diagonal. 7. Tangent 55 is 1 times x. x is, here we go, we're going to get how far the fire is away. 9.997. They want you round to the nearest whole mile, nearest tenth. Well, that's still going to be 10.0. That's 10.0, right? When you try to 9.997 rounds to 10.0. That fire is 10 miles south of ranger number one. Is that good? See how triangulation works? In two short weeks, you've gained the math skills to triangulate. How would the problem be structured if the 35 was actually inside the, inside the increment? Consider, because now we subtracted 90, will there ever be a case where it, it's a word problem structure like that, but uh -huh. the 35 is inside the increment? Yeah, they could. How, how would that look? Or? Um, yeah, so if, if they said, all right, one ranger's going to head south. See, we have the two rangers here. Um, and they tell you, uh, wait, how's it going to be? Mm -hmm. um, and they tell you, this guy's, this guy's bearing, this is Ranger A here. They say, Ranger A A's bearing is south 40 degrees east. So see Ranger A here. Here's his north, south, north, south, east, and west. So they say, Ranger A to the fire, or whatever. Let's say Ranger B goes straight south, you know, whatever, 10 miles straight south. And the fire's over here. Ranger A sighting to the fire is bearing is, is south, straight south, but 40 degrees east of that. 40 degrees east of that. That's an angle already in the triangle. Don't need to subtract 90. Make sense? Would, so it, be, would it be just 10 or would it be minus 10? So I just made this up and made it no, for no, 10. No, no, I'm talking about the actual problem. This right here? Oh, because it's south, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, we just say 10. It's distance. Distance, we always get positive, right? Like if I drive down to L.A., I don't say I drove negative 240. We just always get positive south, yeah. Yeah, that's good. All right, so that good on that? Well, yeah. Okay, so you use the 55 degrees to determine, like, which would be the opposite and the adjacent. So right. why didn't you use, like, where the first ranger was? Okay, so, so this is my triangle here. That's my triangle. So I need to use angles in that triangle. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? So that's actually much of so, so these are my three angles in my triangle. This side is X, 7, and I don't know that other side. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're using the angles in that triangle. And isn't the opposite angle also the same thing? Same thing as what? Like 35 over there. Oh, yeah. This one will be 35, yeah. Yeah. It's called alternate interior angles. Is that what you got? It's just a geometry thing. Yeah, it is. Anyway, is that good? That all making sense? The ranger problem, you like that? Being able to do something practical that you always hear about? A little triangulization. That's how they do that. Can't become a, can't become a ranger unless you uh, know that math.
No, I'm kidding. They, I'm sure they just use <laughs> instruments. But somebody writes the programs for those instruments. Somebody who does understand the math, it gets paid quite well. Okay. So um, you go from your house, you go seven miles, seven miles due west, then um, you leave home. So you leave home, go seven miles due west, then 5.5 miles due north. Due north means straight north, right? So draw an axis system. Here's your home. Okay, and then go from your home. Here's north, south, east, and west. Go um, whatever it is, seven, seven miles due west, then 5.5 miles due north. And then once you, when you're done, they want to know the bearing from your house to your end point. Yeah. Uh, well, no. That would give you the, the distance, but they don't want the distance. They want the bearing. They want the angles. That would give you distance, but they don't want distance. So there goes. So due west. Everybody good with that? Seven miles straight west. Or I could just do it this way. So the person heads seven miles west. We good? And then 5.5 miles north, and here's where they end. They end up right there. Is everybody good there? From home, they went 7 miles west and 5.5 miles straight north. Due west, due north. Now, the question put to us, at that time, at your ending point, what is your bearing from your house? So, going back to the house, pointing straight at your ending point. In other words, if you just went there diagonally instead, what would be your bearing? So how would we find the bearing from home? What that direction of pointing, what direction is that? You just said you do the inverse, right? Well, what angle do we need to find first off? First off, let's say, is this bearing, this, this black line here, this black diagonal line, is it, remember how you write a bearing, you start with north or south, and then you do an angle, and then it's east or west, right? We always start with north or south. So, so this black line, is it m more up or more down? Yeah. It's up. It's going to start with north, isn't it? You getting the hang of the bearing thing, how you write the bearings? Mm -hmm. So bearings are always written north or south first. So north is up, south is down. So I'm going to go north, but not straight north, huh? North and then what? West. Some degree, call that theta, theta west. So that's the theta I need. Does that make sense? I need to know that theta. My bearing is north, something west. Something west of north. Right? Now, how, now to find that, I'm going to have to first find this angle. Call it x or whatever. What? Why this one? Because this one's in the triangle. I need one of them that's actually inside the triangle to do my Sokotoa stuff. Could you... Right? Could you do, just find... The angle, because theta is going to match the it angle is. on that side. So if you know that, that's a nice trick. This is theta, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to pretend I don't know that trick, and because I don't think most people would know it. So that's a nice trick One. if you know it, but I'm just going to find this x here. So if I just find x, that's an angle in the triangle, so I can use my Sokotoa stuff. Once I get that, subtract from 90, you'll have our theta. That's our bearing. Is that good? See the game plan? Let's find that x. that way first, and then I well, that's the other one, yeah. yeah. So how do I find X in this triangle? Got these two. What am I going to do? Inverse. What have I been doing all day? Inverse tangent. Tangent again, and then it'll become inverse, yeah. Tangent again, right? So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to go, okay, tangent of X is opposite 5.5 over 7. Opposite over adjacent. Tangent of X is 5.5 over 7. Does that make sense? Opposite over adjacent. Now I need x 
I need to solve for x. How am I going to solve that for x? What am I going to do to solve that for x? Could I divide both sides by tangent? Right, this is what we talked about earlier. You cannot divide by a trig function like that. Why not? That's not multiplication. That does not mean tangent times x. That's just what it looks like, but you've got to know deeper than what it looks like. That's why I'm always doing the toaster talk. Think of that x as plugged into the toaster. It's not just sitting on the counter next to the toaster. It's plugged into the toaster. So the only way to get that x out of the toaster, out of the tangent, is inverse tangent. Right? That's why we have inverse trig functions. You ever wonder, like, why, why, do we, why do we make, did they just want to make up more math? Well, they knew real, remember, math, math is made up. They didn't make it up, that's true. But they made it up because they had to solve real life problems like this one. And they thought, how do we get that x out of the tangent? How do we get that thing out of there? Oh, inverse tangent. So they made up inverse trig functions. That's what they made it up for. They made up logarithms in higher math per count because they, they had to get things out of exponential functions, which happen all the time in um, economic applications, financial applications. So, uh, so they have to get that x out of there. So I'm going to go, get this words out of here. I'm going to go inverse tangent on this side. Whatever you do to one side, you have no choice but to do the same thing to the other side. You've got to keep the balance, right? If two things are equal, treat them the same, still be equal. Right? So what happens here? Tangent inverse and tangent cancel each other. That's why I did it. I wanted tangent to go away. So x would be alone. On the other side, the tangent inverse remains. He stays, doesn't he? It cancels on one side, but remains on the other. And I hit the buttons on my happy little calculator. Tangent inverse, 5.5 divided by 7. I'm getting 38 point, I don't know, 1, 6 degrees. So this is, this little X angle here is 38.16 degrees. And so now how do we find theta? Subtract from 90. Clarence's favorite step, right? We have to always do it, Clarence. No, I'm kidding. I, we, we talked about that. There's a few times when we don't, but it's almost always, isn't it? Yeah, 90, so we get it by 90 degrees minus 38.16, which equals, what is it, 51.84. I don't know how much accuracy they want. So, so that angle there, 51.84, this angle here is 51. So what that, that gives me my bearing from my home to the point I ended up in when I went west to north. My bearing is, the final answer is north, 51.8 degrees, let's say, round to one place, west. Right? Because we had north, but 51.8 west of north. That's the bearing from your home to the point you ended up in. That'd be how you'd have to head diagonally to get straight to that ending point instead of west and north. How we doing? You guys look like you've been doing three hours of math for four straight days or something. Plus homework, huh? I'd like to say I have something easy for you now, but that would be a lie. The next chapter is not too easy. Well, it's, yes, the first part especially is not. How are we doing? Is that okay? Is that one okay with the bearing and everything? All right. I'm going to...